The Drumming News Network is the fastest growing daily news source for drummers. Feed your passion. Visit daily for all the drumming news. Drummingnewsnetwork.com. Hello, everybody. This is Paul Rog Rogney from Drumming News Network. And with me, I have Rob Wallace, who formed DCI in 1982 and later on uh, as a co founder of Hudson Music. Welcome. And of course, hey. Rob Cook, author. Uh, Chicago Drum Show, so many amazing books. Uh, both these guys are such an education uh, with, with, with everything to do from musical um, learning to his, the history of drums. So, guys, thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. So, in May, uh, it was announced by Hudson Music that you are now offering digital versions of uh, Mr. Cook's books. Can you talk about how that process came about? Sure. Um, I guess I'll go first. I, I, I've been a, a fan of Rob's work and, and all his books. Um, and I love personally love vintage drums and just felt that our uh, platform might help spread the word to other people that might not have access to his books. Um, you know, because it's online, it, it's, you know, obviously uh, worldwide. So access is really easy for people if you're, you know, in, in, in Japan or, England or, you know, wherever, and maybe don't have access to picking up a, a physical copy of the book. And that that's really the idea behind the whole Hudson website, you know, is just to get as much content there for drummers and let people, you know, pick what they want and uh, hopefully make, make it available and, and easily accessible. So that's about how it, it happened. And just being a, a fan of Rob's books, um, you know, we've done a few things in the past with his uh, the uh, vintage drum show, which hopefully this year I hope to attend, and um, uh, it just that we put it together and and that's the way it happened. It was pretty quick. Well, a number of these books are out of publication, and I know you're offering them in a digital interface. Um, is that will that interface be available on a cell phone as well in an app format? Yes. Or okay, it, it, it's it's available for any device, and now. We even have a web-based browser, so you don't need to download any kind of app or anything to be able to, to see to see the book. Okay. Um, yeah, which is great. And it interfaces with every computer, every handheld device, and is yes. good. Yep. yep. Um, quickly, before we, we talk to Rob, um, could you talk a little bit about the process of creating a digital format of the book? Because essentially, you have to kind of rewrite it all for publication digitally, correct? you want me to answer that one please yes um not really i mean we we use the basic text of the book you know the book reader acts like a book uh you know you you, you flip pages and so forth mm -hmm. um, and rob's books don't have them but some of the books that have any kind of external media like video or audio there's just a little button that you tap and the screen opens up and the video plays and you then you minimize it. You keep going, you know, through the book or if there's audio, you know, you just tap it and it'll play the audio so you can work on the exercise and, and hear the audio at the same time. So it's, it's a really elegant and it's a great tool. I feel the digital books actually when there is media, I feel it's better than a physical book because you don't have to worry about finding an audio file or going to a website or, or downloading something. It's mm -hmm. just the digital book. It's right there in front of you. And, um, you know, for Rob's books, they're, uh, you know, all the text is there. They're really identical to the, um, to the physical book. We use the same files as what goes to the printer actually. Oh, okay. That's I guess that was my question too because I know with the digital format books, depending on the device, they have to modify digitally versus right. taking a PDF and scaling it. So um, I just was wondering if that was an in-depth process. But since you can actually use his files, that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's great. And sometimes we just have to manipulate them to fit the page properly. But it's uh, you know we have guys that do that and you know do really great work on that. So the stuff looks you know looks really good when you when you're seeing it on your screen. Fantastic. So, Rob, uh, Mr. Cook, if you could please talk a little bit about <laughs> two Robs, not what we're going to do. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how they approached you and, and your thought process about going digital with your books? Uh, sure, sure. I was I was really glad to hear from Rob because um, cut me off if this gets too long winded, but uh, 
the, most of my publications are, you know, histories of drum companies and biographies of drummers. And uh, there, there are several books in my catalog that were done by other people. Like uh, for a while I was doing Traps the Drum Wonder, which was an Oxford book originally. It went out of print and uh, Oxford couldn't see their way to reprinting it. Uh, and I worked out a deal with uh, Mel Torme, the author, on uh, a limited run. I just paid the royalty on, I don't know, a thousand copies or whatever, and we, we uh, printed it. But my the, the larger point I'm, I'm trying to get to is uh, it, this is a very niche market business. All of, I mean, uh, I, I once uh, exhibited at a ABA convention, largest group of booksellers and publishers and so on in the world, and I didn't sell a book there. <laughs> they, they had an area for a small, small press, uh, and you could get a table for a couple hundred bucks, and uh, you couldn't put out more than eight titles or something, but it was, it was perfect for somebody like me. But when you look at uh, 100,000 book buyers, uh, how many of them are interested in drum history? First, <laughs> if, if they don't have a store that specializes in it, uh, they're certainly not going to have a clientele that is beating down the door for it. So uh, most of my, my books have been a print run of anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000. And 5,000 is only going to be for a book like the Ludwig book or mm -hmm. the Gretsch or one of the, the bigger ones. Um, and the, the way the numbers kind of shake out, if, if somebody comes to me with a manuscript and they they want to get it printed and I have to kind of explain, well, yeah, I could probably sell 50 of those over the next five years, but, uh, anything that you print for the most part, that's under a thousand copies, you've got a real challenge. Try to keep your head above water. Uh, there, there are other ways of going, like uh, print on demand, but uh, and there you can print as little as ten copies, but it costs a lot more. The, the quality isn't the same as you know the the regular offset printing and and so on. So the the dilemma for somebody like me with a very niche market, I I, I can sell more of my books at drum shows like the Chicago Drum Show and so on than uh, trying to go to general bookstores or anything like that. Uh, and uh, what I, Hal Leonard distributed a lot of my hard copy books uh, for, for a number of years. Um, and the challenge I ran into there was they feed a lot of large retailers that are used to big discounts and used to selling at a discount. And I discovered uh, at one point that any ISBN and cover image of a coming Rebeats book that was turned over to Hal Leonard so it would be in their catalog for the next season immediately fed some of their resellers. And sometimes my books were being sold at discount by those resellers before I even had the books in my hand. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, that that didn't work for me. So so my then my mo became to only sell the books myself at retail at my drum show for the first six months uh, until I kind of made some of my nut back. And then once I kind of filled the pipeline as best I could, then ship it to Hal Leonard for a little bit wider market penetration. Um, and so that's why it was really great to hear from Rob because it was a whole new market segment uh, that I wasn't reaching and I couldn't afford to do that on my own, obviously, because uh, it, it, these books are not like uh, tires or groceries that everybody needs. And if you spend the kind of money that the food producers and the tire companies spend on advertising, sure, I'd sell a lot more, but it would be eaten up in that advertising. Mm -hmm. So I, I was uh, very thankful for Rob to open a whole new avenue of distribution and reach more people in ways that I, I couldn't on my own. So it very, worked out very nicely. 
So, but a lot of your books are out of print or close to being out of print. So now this is, Hudson is about the only place you can go now to read these books. Well, I do have uh, an arrangement with Ingram for print on demand. Uh, and I don't even have to stock them. Uh, I mean, yeah. they, uh, I, it's kind of the same formatting. I, I send Ingram a PDF that's formatted to their specifications and, after it's cleared their checklist and approved and everything and uh, goes into their system, boom, it's available pretty much worldwide. They have print facilities in the UK and uh, the European continent and Australia. Uh, so again, I'm reaching more parts of the world. Sending a Gretsch book at four pounds to <laughs> Europe I mean, the the book is forty dollars, and it's yeah. like sixty seven dollars to to mail it, and that just <laughs> didn't make sense. But uh, the print on demand uh, um, has helped, <laughs> and and keeps keeps books in print that wouldn't otherwise be worth uh, redoing. One one was uh, uh, best seat in the house by uh, Jerry Shirley, the uh, uh, drummer with humble pie. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that did pretty well for for a while. Then it tapered off, and and after what was it, five years, six years, it, uh, by the time we finally ran out of hard copy altogether, um, it just wouldn't. It was selling so few copies that I just couldn't justify printing a thousand of them. So it it worked perfectly into that scenario with uh, Ingram. And and it kind of took off. It, it took a little splurge when it first came out on Ingram's uh, POD plan. I, I I I think in the six or eight months it's been out, I've sold maybe a couple hundred in the U U.S. and a couple hundred in Europe and a handful in Australia. So that that's working out. Nobody's getting rich, but it's important uh, for myself and the author, obviously, to to keep it available there was a lot of work putting it together so it's mm -hmm. it's nice that it's still out there well rob how long ago did hudson get into providing digital book formats you know we've been doing it for a while um several years mm -hmm. you know we've been through a few different iterations of players and so forth um fortunately or unfortunately you know when covid hit the demand went way up because people were all over the world were, you know, kind of trapped in their houses. Um, gigs were canceled, tours were canceled, you know, whatever. And so people were looking for things to do at home and nothing easier than hitting a button, putting in your credit card and, and getting a book, you know, instantly, mm -hmm. you know, with no mailing, no, you know, kind of no fuss, no muss. So, you know, the, the, the catalog grew and the demand grew, you know, quite a bit over the past three years. But okay. we, we've been at it. We were early on, um, you know, in terms of digital books, very early on. Um, but as we've kind of gotten, you know, the world has turned more and more digital, uh, you know, our physical sales, like Rob's saying, have, you know, have gone down and, and our, our digital sales have gone up. So it's mm -hmm. been a real... Um, you know, thank goodness, or, you know, Hudson would be probably on some very thin ice if we didn't have, <laughs> you know, kind of the digital, um, you know, backbone that we have. And, you know, to me, like I said, you know, a little earlier, it, it's a great format, especially when there's media, because it really, you don't have to have a DVD player or a CD player or go online. It's just right. It's, it's instant touch. So it's right there. I'm and, intrigued uh, by that, uh, the the media. So like with instructional books and where there's a uh, transcription of something, you can just hear how it's played. Yeah. If the if we set the book up that way, you know, and we, we have a new player now for transcriptions where, yeah, it's at the bottom of the screen and, and you know, the it kind of lights up and, and even there's a counter on the side of the bar that, shows you where the downbeats are in case you get wow. lost nice. um, and there's a click if you want it so yeah you know that it's all uh evolving you know like yeah. everything in in the media world right um yeah. but yeah it's been you know it's been uh in, in nicely accepted and and i think we were uh, ahead of the curve and and you know i'm really glad um you know 
for for me, like I said, I just want to try to make as much content uh, from all over the world available to people all over the world. So, you know, every day we're getting, you know, authors from Italy and India and, you know, Japan. You know, it's it's pretty incredible, you know, partly because, you know, we're one of the, le you know, last men standing. Um, but, uh, you know, I just and I have a hard time saying no to people. So it's uh, c coupling that, you know, it's the catalog has grown, you know, quickly and. You know, I have a great group of guys that that put the books together and 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 oversee all the digital work that we do. Were you able to update uh, some of the original stuff, like the old uh, DCI VHS videos? Have those been? Um, yes, yeah, some. Um, yes, we've we've uh, we've done some licensing back. Alfred owns that old catalog that that. Uh -huh my partner and I did back starting in the eighties. Um, and, uh, you know, we actually have an announcement will coming out probably in the spring on, on a new project involving some of the old titles, but, oh. uh, which is pretty cool. But, um, yeah, you know, we, we, we also, besides books, you know, we have a whole digital video player and, um, you know, all of our videos and, and a bunch of the old ones are available. Nice. you know, as digital uh, downloads. Nice. Just out of interest, you know, some of the old publications of drum magazines, as we're seeing a good amount of the drum magazines going away, is that, is there an opportunity for you to be able to offer those? It's a great, you know, it's a great, it's a great idea. I'm going to have to write that one down. I'll take 10%. Uh, <laughs> you know, I tell you, I always felt, you know, years ago, and, you know, I, I used to deal with all of the, major drum magazines around the world you know we you know i'd see the guys once a year at nam or if i was over at the frankfurt music fair um i i always felt that the magazines and, and this was even before kind of the decline of print you know newspapers and magazines in general i i used to just feel if there was some way of setting up a clearinghouse of articles because if you know, if there's a magazine in the United States that puts out a story on, you know, Steve Gadd, and there's a, a magazine in Japan that puts one out, and there's a magazine in Italy that puts one out, if they're all in their native languages, I, I don't see how they compete. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right. People in Italy buy the Italian version, and people in Japan buy the Japanese version. And I just felt that every month these magazines would, you know, kill themselves to get content you know, month after month, when if there was some kind of sharing happening, I think it would have saved a lot of those businesses because a lot of them, unfortunately, uh, are like you're saying, uh, Paul, they're gone, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, and it's a shame because I think some of the magazines had some really creative, um, you know, output and, and, you know, and exposed drummers that maybe were under the radar that weren't the top same 20, you know, drummers that everybody wanted to know about, but, you know, they would drill down a little deeper and talk mm -hmm. about, you know, studio players that you didn't know, or, you know, touring drummers that uh, were in, you know, not the biggest bands, but sort of the B and C level, you know, uh, acts that, that, that are, you know, were great players. And I think that's missed. Um, mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it's a shame that the, um, you know, there's been such a drop off in, in the number of magazines around the world. It's not just a U.S. kind of phenomenon. Right. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think a, a drum magazine, as well as a tactile book, is very important, but also the digital format, too, because, like you said, it it kind of crosses the bridge to, uh, if you're, in, you know, if you're traveling or, or anything, you know, or instant totally. gra totally. gratification. So yeah. I, think, I think both formats are still very critical but i still yeah. I, I swear I, I love drum magazines you know just historically having them and, and you know if there's a way to search through digitally <laughs> you know to search through to say my look at my favorite drummer and pull up every article that'd be you know, that'd be fantastic yeah it's a great it's a great idea to, to have an archive of, of all these articles you know mm -hmm. um you know especially you know in various languages and you know if, the, if they could all be shared language you know an article that was done you know on you know max roach in italy if we could get that in english and, and and let american you know drummers read it you know stuff like that 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 would be great 
We're trying a, a drumming news network here on Sundays throughout December. Uh, Rhythm and Drum Magazine over in Japan. We're, one of the articles, since that magazine's gone out of print, unfortunately, uh, we're taking a special on John Bonham and we convert it. We transferred it to English. Mm. And we're trying to see how, the, how well that'll work and uh, see if we can talk to them more about sharing some more of their old articles uh, that they had. Because it was, it was a good, it's cool to have a viewpoint on a drummer that is so worldly loved, worldly loved um from another country's point of view you know <laughs> it's just kind of neat absolutely so. yeah if there's anything we can do to be a part of that you know i would i would love to just expose more people to you know whatever it is you're working on and that was a great magazine i used to you know i used to get uh, the the downside was every month i'd end up with you know a stack of drum magazines <laughs> every month you know from all over the world because we right. were advertising and you know, they wanted me to see, you know, what they were doing. So it was, but it was great. And and that was a great magazine, very high quality, you know, paper they used it, great photography. It was very, it was just sad to see that one go. Well, one more question, uh, talking about DCI, uh, you know, you, is it fair to say that DCI was the innovator of video drum education? Pretty much. Yeah. 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 Uh, so we, we started uh, in 19, in 1980, 81. Okay. So back then video production was ridiculously expensive. <laughs> so, um, and now it's, it's still expensive, but I mean, compared to then, you know, a shoot like that could cost thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 maybe for a... Oh, easily. You know, the, the, the equipment alone, we used to rent these cameras that were, you know, $75,000 cameras. They, you know, they would rent for, you know, roughly a thousand dollars a day. And then you'd rent the lens, <laughs> yeah, it's another sixty or seventy thousand dollar piece of equipment for another thousand. So I mean, e each wow. camera was in New York at least, right? Um, which I'm sure is on the high side. But you know, we were spending just on camera per day, not including the operator. Then you pay the cameraman, mm -hmm. you know, a daily a fee for ten hours. Yeah. So our our expenses in the I mean, really in the beginning. In the this was in the infancy of video, you know, we would tape lights to the ceiling. I mean, my partner and I had no idea what we were doing. We we didn't come from a technical background. We were both drummers. And um I had heard from a friend that said, you know what, there's this thing called the VCR coming. Everyone's gonna have one in their living room one day and it's gonna play, you know, these tapes and you could be able to record on them and, and hook them up to your TV in your living room and watch you know, videos that you make and other people and get, they'll sell movies probably. So I, I jumped on it, you know, really early on. And, um, you know, we just, we just sort of learned the hard way, you know, mm -hmm. getting cameras. We, you know, we knew nothing about lenses and cameras and, and so forth. And then I realized, you know, as, as we started progressing and, and seeing that there was an interest, you know, we kept raising the bar in terms of the quality of the work we were doing and, hiring, you know, better and better people and better, better equipment. And then there was a lighting director and then we needed, it, it, it got crazy. You, you know, mm -hmm. then we needed a, a, a day for lighting. So right. we'd have to have the studio for an extra day just to do the lighting. Um, then we, we had such a big crew Then we needed catering. And then we used to have to have somebody, <laughs> you know, whose job was just to make sure there was food for everybody. Right. So it, it, got, it got, it got crazy. Um, and in hindsight, you know, it, it was probably a little too crazy, but we, we, we always tried to deliver the highest quality that we could afford. And sometimes, you know, we, we didn't make the, you know, our investment back, um, during the, you know, the real sort of heyday in the, in the eighties and early nineties of video, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, we, we spent a lot, but we knew it would come back, you know, towards the end, we got burned a few times because we spent more than we should have. And, and we didn't ever recoup that money because right. the, the, the video was starting to trail off at that point. And then, you know, YouTube came and then, you know, then all, everything hit the, hit the fan at that point, so to speak. But, um, yeah, yeah, we, you know, we were to come back to your question, we were the first company to do educational drum videos for sure in the world. I mean, how did you get some of those drummers on board? Like, for instance, Neil Peart, Peart, sorry, I always say Peart, sorry. Neil Peart, um, you did a number of videos with him. And he, as, I, as far as I understand, he's kind of a private person. I'm sure after you did the first one, he wanted to come back to you. But was a work in progress the first one you did? 
Yeah, work in progress. That was the first educational one. Um, you know, with Neil, we wanted to work with him for years. And Neil was was a very private person. Um, he, he he rarely even spoke on the phone. We used to send, you know, we had his address. We would send him a letter. We'd say, hey, Neil, what do you think? We want to do an instructional video with you. And he'd write back, you know, a month later, we'd get a letter back. Yeah, I, I want to do it too, but I'm really busy with the band. or we're, we're starting writing now, or we're recording now, or we're touring. You know, it was a, a, a pretty much a all, all year round, um, you know, time consuming to be in rush for, you know, for, for Neil, you know, they'd have some down vacation time, but they were, it was, it was always something going on. And mm -hmm. so it, that went on for years. We would write every six months. He would write back. We would write to him, went back and forth. And finally one day we get a letter back from him. He said, um, he said, okay, you know, you wore me down. I'm going to be on, on the West, on the East coast in the winter um, this was six months, you know, he, his schedule was planned out way, way in advance. He said, I know I'm going to, when I'm going to, I have can carve out a little bit of time and let's start planning this thing. And, um, but backing up before that, you know, with the first time we actually worked with Neil was on, um, one of the tribute to Buddy Rich, the scholarship concerts that, that Kathy Rich put on. That was the one in New York that, that Neil sort of ventured out of rush. It was his first sort of outside project, so to speak. Um, and we filmed that. So we got to meet Neil at that point and he saw the way we worked and, and that we were, um, you know, we, we didn't try to take advantage of, of him or anything. You know, we treated him just like everyone else, even though the line for that show was three blocks down the street in New York because I people did ever see Neil. It was crazy that the fire department was screaming at me to let people in the building or they were going to shut the show down because they were concerned about traffic jams on <laughs> in Midtown Manhattan. But um, aside from that, so, you know, we got to work with Neil then. And then um, after that, he called and asked if we would be interested in filming a record he was producing called A, a, a Burning for Buddy. And I think it had, tw you know, 20 four drummers or something that over the course of two weeks, every day there were, you know, two guys coming in and they would record a tune with, with Buddy's big band in New York. Mm -hmm. And it was a, you know, it was a who's who of everyone you could, you could think of at that point. So, and he, he wanted it very low key. He didn't want a big crew in there. He, he wanted my partner and myself to film, which we'd never done before. So we went out and bought some small cameras and did the best we could with two cameras trying to cover, you know, all these drummers coming in, plus what was happening out in the lobby, which was, you know, a, a, an incredible hang. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, getting the big band and everything. But, it, it you know, it was a lot of work. We, we were working like 15 hours a day every day for two weeks. But it came out great. And, you know, we, we got along great with Neil. Um, and and those were kind of the 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 baby steps to to get to start working with him on his own projects. And then, you know, we became very good friends. Um, he, he, as time went on, he kind of took us more and more into his inner circle, which was mm -hmm. a very small circle of people that that he was comfortable with. And you know, we would yeah, at that point then we we were emailing, and you know there was you know, communications changed. We were, you know, it was such a long period of time that we knew Neil and were first after him. And then second, when we started working together, you know, we would, we would email. I mean, I have like true, I saved a lot of them. I, I should probably get some old computer drives and I saved troves of these emails from him because every one of them was beautifully written. You know, he was a fantastic yeah. writer. Um, So yeah, that's how it happened. So uh, just recently, um, you guys posted a story. I, I, sorry, I posted a story about you guys uh, that you released a number of authentically signed Neil Peart um, posters and DVDs, right? Not not a lot. We had, you know, we, we, we released some. Um, mm -hmm. When Neil passed, um, I wanted to do something um, to honor him and we started a scholarship through the Percussive Arts Society, the Neil Pert Drum Set Scholarship. And, it, you know, it's kind of low key. Um, 
we we and we used the uh, revenue from the sales of some signed posters and 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 books and and DVDs to uh, to fund it. Um, and you know, I, I didn't want to make it a big commercial thing. Um, yeah, you know, we saw you know Neil the price of his signed things are you know astronomical, so yeah. we tried to price it when when we would sell something you know that it was you know reasonable that made sense for the buyer it made sense that we, you know we were collecting revenue for the scholarship and um we're we're in starting our third year in fact i just was uh, emailing with pas um to make sure that the the account is still good i want to maybe increase the number of scholarships we give out um next year starting next year and I'm working on a project. I'm hopefully finalizing something with, with Neil's wife, um, where we can have something available to sell that'll also bring in more funds for the scholarship, so we can increase the the amount of scholarships we give. Okay, then one more question with that. Um, I posted the story about three weeks ago. I think it is. Do you have any of those signatures still available if people want to buy them? A couple. There's a couple, still, okay. there is some. You know, I I, I want to. Um, not not kind of flood them into the market mm -hmm. um, because they're special and uh, sort of you know once they're gone you know they're they're obviously they're gone we'll never have them again but yeah there's some and you know people can reach out to us and if they're interested okay fantastic so Mr Cook let me to ignore you. Oh no! Like no. I said, oh, I love both of you guys so much. Again, yeah, I've never sorry, met you. Rob, I'm yapping away here. I'm just <laughs> yapping away. Oh no, I'm I'm loving it. Uh, particularly the the early video stuff because I and hats off for dealing with that kind of investment and it and it paid off and it was obvious in your work. Mm -hmm. I I have to admit, <laughs> one of my first projects before I think I need books. Maybe the Frank Drum Shop book came first, but. But actually, my first project uh, when I was getting into drum history stuff was a video. And I was at the other end of the spectrum, man. Uh, and, and people have to understand that are hearing this, that probably people hearing this that weren't even born then. But, <laughs> but the, the, the state of video equipment back then, I, I, uh, I decided I, wa I wanted to learn about vintage drums. And I thought the best way to do it is talk to seek out the people that knew as much as I figured could be known. And I, I had this list of targets, Harry Kangany in Indianapolis and John Aldridge, he was in Boulder at the time and Bill Ludwig the uh, second in Chicago area and, and a couple of others. And I borrowed a, what for them was a pretty decent camera from Dow Chemical, one of my music store employees had a part-time gig over there and got his foot in the door and borrowed this nice camera. And we drove for like a, on a 72 hour road trip and went to Chicago and Iowa. And I, I had to fly to, to Boulder and back taking the camera, but, uh, and then, and I knew nothing. So it was just getting these guys in front of a camera and asking them every dumb question I could think of. <laughs> And then watching all this footage back and trying to organize it in a chronology and to produce this video, Introduction to Vintage Drums. And all of these guys agreed to do it on a royalty basis only. And it was like $1.60 for every tape I sold up, up to 500 which was my break even. And then it would jump up a couple dollars. But the editing for that was done on a Umatic, uh, you know, home studio kind of thing. And then a little later on, I got uh, an early tape editing system. Panasonic had an SVHS system with two SVHS decks and a little controller. But again, you're you're looking for the cut spot and marking it and going to the end of the cut, marking it, dumping that into your master. And just a lot of thought process, almost like early audio multi-tracking with a TF where you had to line up the record and play heads, you know. Uh, and today it just looks so easy by comparison. You just dump it into Final Cut and it, you do all the editing with your mouse and everything. But 
But the end result of that VHS tape, Introduction to Vintage Drums, was, was pretty darn crude. I, I couldn't get Modern Drummer to even review it. I thought I'd get some <laughs> mileage, and they weren't responding. I finally called them, and they pretty much said, you know, if you can't say something nice about something, don't say anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, and it was true. But on the other hand, I did sell the 500 and then another 100 after that. And the people that bought it, I, I didn't get any quality complaints. And it was rough. It was a this old house kind of thing. But the basic content mm -hmm. and, and what these guys knew and were sharing was, was pretty solid. So I, I kind of got away with it. <laughs> Is that video available still? No, uh, I think, well, of course, the chief is gone, uh, Bill Ludwig, and uh, I would have to, by rights, go back to everybody and work out a new deal. And <laughs> so, so there'd yeah. be new contracts and stuff. One guy in particular was pretty fussy okay. uh, about monitoring the royalties and wanting to yeah. know updates on the quantity sold and everything. So with the exception of that one guy that I won't even mention the name of, I, I almost could do it, but, and I could just put it up on YouTube at this point, but I, I really can't. <laughs> so. Well, so that's one point, cause I, I do want to get back to you in a second, but um, as I'm finding out the hard way, <laughs> um, our publishing rights to images and having um, permissions to use and different royalty fees. Uh, is that a process you had to go through with these books turning into digital? Did you have to offer or uh, renegotiate uh, licensing fees for images? Uh, not me. Um, and I, frankly, I don't think I even, I'm trying to think if I've ever paid for a photo. I mean, I'm basically using old, pretty much public domain stuff, pictures out of catalogs okay. and, and, and books that I did with, uh, you know, Hal Blaine and uh, Bill Ludwig and, more of the shine and everything they were giving me access to their you know personal photos so uh, are like logos considered to be public domain that kind of stuff too i i would say yes i might be technically wrong but i think where you would run into trouble is selling something at a profit with a logo on it where you're making money off of the logo right but on the other hand if you're just an, an educational thing uh if i'm writing an article and i i'm not afraid to put the logos in there just because people recognize them and and um so I, that's not a legal opinion but i pretty much can tell right from wrong <laughs> right no exactly it, it's just um it, it's amazing like so for instance a buddy of mine was frankie benelli and he played for a band called quiet riot wasp and billy idol and I have a series of cards we're going to be putting out for the show that are just pre-promotional cards. You know, they promote a drummer, you know, and mm -hmm. they get something for the drummer to sign to give to somebody, that kind of stuff. Kind of, kind of a fun thing. So I found an image that I wanted to, I wanted to use for the card as a tribute card to Frank Benelli. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I contacted the company that represents the photographer. And to start the process was $10,000 for him, for them to talk to each person. Then I'd have to have a separate negotiation with each one of those people <laughs> i'm like i was up to yeah. like 30 forty thousand dollars and i'm like these are free handouts i mean you know <laughs> yeah it's like yeah. wow you know so i publishing can get really kind of crazy at times and, and it's, it's a really yeah. interesting thing it's it's not an easy yeah. thing that either one of you are doing in hudson yeah. i can only imagine uh a lot of your time and effort is put into you know crossing your t's dotting your i's yeah. when it comes to releasing a video I wanted, yeah. I wanted to use some audio once for, I, after the introduction to vintage drums came out, then I took a stab at a video drum magazine. And I think I had four issues out and I do interviews at basic and so on and put those in. And there was a Koopa song that kind of appealed to me that I wanted to use as a lead in. And I thought for that, I better ask, you can't just put a Koopa song that's, that's been, uh, uh, recorded and published and and so on and and use it in that kind of context in a for-profit thing and i i uh looked into who had the rights to it and that, that all roads led to sony and i i approached sony about using it and it was going to be thirty thousand dollars or something. 
<laughs> and I was talking on a budget. I, I figured I could afford maybe one hundred and fifty dollars or something. Exactly. But, and I, I tried to point out the context and how many of these were going to sell and at what price and everything. But I had to kind of fold up and walk home on that one. <laughs> was that Drumview magazine? No, it was just called uh, Rebeats. Uh, uh, video drum magazine. Oh, I missed that one. I never saw that one. Okay. Yeah. I thought those, the, the... those actually, I've got two or three of them. They're probably pretty horrible quality. They're 720 and everything, even the master. But uh, I could probably convert those now and put them on YouTube. And maybe I should. But there was some kind of interesting stuff. Visited the world's largest bass drums and and uh, talked about them, gave the history of them and showed the drums and stuff and that kind of thing. Oh, that's really cool um well, let's just quickly talk about your history so you kind of alluded to earlier that you went out and interviewed a number of people about um the different types of drum companies because you wanted to get into history what drew you to creating these books because these books for any collector for anybody who's into the drumming history these are the bibles of each one of these companies there's, there's a lot of work to put you put into that how long did that take to you to pull that together and um what was yeah. the process there was no grand plan and one thing just kind of led to another uh people oh boy this is going to get lengthy cut me off this is going too long but, but but the motivating factor was largely the oil embargo of 1983 i was selling a lot of drums i was selling a drum set a week and uh at that time which was when the oil embargo hit gas prices ran up gas stations were closing all over and anything with petroleum in it, records, drum heads, blah, 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 uh, drum coverings, everything was skyrocketing in price. And my drum sales hit the skids. And uh, I had shelves and shelves of old drums that I'd been taking in and trade in my music store for years. And actually I had a customer in who alerted me to the fact that I had a, a bunch of valuable stuff back there. And I, I had no clue and I wanted to learn about it. And I thought, well, other people are in the same boat and are going to want to learn too. So that's what led to the video, the introduction to vintage drum. And in the course of that and a few other projects, I came across all of George Way's archives in storage in Elkhart, Indiana. And, and uh, when he passed away, his widow was in poor health and moved back to Canada and all of his stuff got packed up and put into storage. And uh, some of it got parceled out to Jim Catalano and a couple other people. But basically I got all of George's correspondence and a lot of personal papers from as far back as his adoption papers and birth certificate wow. and personal letters of correspondence to all these drummers and and uh, hundreds of photos from through his whole career, the Leedy and his own drum company and on and on. And that led me to the first Leedy book. And then that led to the Ludwig book and Slingerland and, and uh, just being a kind of a detail oriented person and curious about the, the tracks that a, a company made as it went and why and who it got sold to and when and why and and so on um and with every single one i felt like it would never really be done there was always be more to learn and more to find out but uh, once i covered the basics of uh, the family background the company business history and then a basic dating guide of how to tell the drums apart from year to year mm -hmm. and then just apply that same pattern to a different company and a different set of people and experts and family members out there to chase down and uh just kind of following the voices and doing them one at a time <laughs> well will there be any other books coming out that you're working on right now that we want yeah to know I'm, working about? On a, I'm working on a symbol book uh Fred Gretsch used to lean on me to do a book called Symbol Wars because he wanted it to be cleared up about all the uh, litigation between Gretsch and Zildjian through the years. And, and whenever he'd bring it up, I always thought well, that's a good way to have everybody in the symbol world hate me. I'm going to have both branches of the Zildjian family upset and, and blah, blah, blah. But, but, uh, 
Armand and Bob are both gone, uh, and I think the time is kind of come. And I've got, uh, I go way back in symbols. I'm not the expert that a lot of people out there are, but uh, I, I have some specific goals. I want to straighten out uh, some of the Zildjian narrative that's gotten twisted through the years, and 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 uh, not to accommodate Fred, but he, he's right. There is a lot that's little known and, and a lot of confusion about the Gretsch owned trademarks of the past and yada, yada. Uh, so we want to straighten that out, give an overall history of symbol making without retracing the steps of Hugo Kingsterbor's book, the symbol book. But then another big part of it is shining a light on the current wave of new symbol smiths. Uh, there are a whole bunch of guys. In fact, the, the drum show program for this year, I, I tried to compile a list of symbol companies and smiths, and there's a hundred of them out there. Wow. Uh, and, and just in this country, there's a dozen really notable symbol smiths um, they, they don't all have foundries they're not doing the casting but they're buying blanks from wherever south america turkey china a few even have gotten sabian to give them blanks but these guys are becoming masters at hammering and lathing and so on and i want to kind of shine a light on those guys uh introduce them explain how they differ from each other and what they're doing and so that's that's the big project in the works yeah well can i back you up a little bit to preface a little bit uh, Guys, about i've actually i'm sorry i i've actually got to run off for a meeting okay. um I, I love i love the conversation rob yeah, we'll, have to, we'll have to do this again yeah yeah, yeah. anytime <laughs> it was great to see you rob and paul thanks for the invite well, thank you yeah. so much for your time. Really it was a pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah, and, uh, pleasure. So, sorry to have to kind of eat and run. <laughs> no worries. No, we'll do no, this again. Pleasure. Thank you. All right. We'll talk soon and keep okay. going. Uh, yeah. I want to watch this and hear what you have. You guys have to say. Okay. Thanks. Excellent. Rob. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah. Um, so historically, could you please speak to um, just a quick overview? Because yes. I'm not actually familiar with the Gretsch Zildjian issue. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that'll preface people. So when the book comes out, they'll actually have an understanding why it's important. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Gretsch uh, imported Zildjian symbols back in the, uh, geez, I, I don't have it in front of me, 1900, 1890, something like that. Um, and they, in a very unusual move that, uh, I, I don't know if it's been done since. Anyway, that's a moot point. They took out a, a trademark on the Zildjian logo. And uh, even the name Zildjian, they owned the trademark on for the United States. Okay. And this was long before the, the uh, American Zildjian company got started. And there was litigation almost immediately in the late 20s. Uh, the, the traditional Zildjian narrative is that um, Aram Zildjian was in charge of things in Istanbul. And when it was time for him to retire, he uh, wrote to Avidus, who had already immigrated to the US, but was a candy maker. And he told Avidus that it was time for him to take over the family business. Avidus writes back and says, well, I'll only do it if you come over here and we do it in the United States. You can come over and teach me how to make symbols. I'll make them here. So that's the beginning of, of uh, the Zildjian company. But it's, uh, and the, the litigation that Gretsch uh, as the owners of the Zildjian name in this country and the, the Zildjian trademark, uh, the outcome of that first litigation was that the American symbol company had to use a Zildjian or Avidus of Zildjian in their trademark and then mm -hmm. all of their advertising and so on. Uh, so that was the first round of litigation, but then it, it proceeded, there's like three more sets, and I kind of go over that in the uh, symbol section of the Gretsch drum book. 
um, which I'll probably kind of use as an, as an outline. But uh, I, at the time I wrote that, I was unaware of some of the later litigation, like in the 50s and 60s and so on. Um, but it, it involves the use of K Zildjian versus A Zildjian and uh, A Zildjian all being the proprietary property of the Avidus Zildjian Company in Norwell and K Zildjian being basically the, the property of Gretsch in this country. But uh, then there's a lot of history to straighten out as to eventually Zildjian in this country bought out uh, K Zildjian in Istanbul um, and uh, brought over um, the workers, not all of the workers, but a couple of key, I think that's when Gabe came over, Gabe Zildjian, and he settled okay. in, in Sabian, at Sabian and so on. But but that's that's a quick overview of what the litigation was about. <laughs> I'm actually slightly confused. So that's going to be exciting to, to get cleared out on that. Uh, so I can understand what's going on with all that, because that is so amazing to me that another company would actually take out a trademark on another company. <laughs> that's pretty weird. Yeah, yeah. But you know, as I've been learning about the drum history, though, it's amazing on how many drum companies back then were not friendly at all. I mean, they were, it was, you know, it was, this is my territory. I'm going to be number one, no matter what it takes. Yeah, yeah. But there were... <laughs> There's a whole section, I think, in the Ludwig book, and they probably in the Slingerland book, too, about the litigation between Ludwig and Slingerland over multiple generations. You know, H.H. Uh, H. Slingerland Sr. and William F. Ludwig Sr. and then H.H. H. Bud Slingerland and Bill II, they're the chief. Uh, and uh, at one point, in, in discussing the, the development of the drum head, I, I was looking into the, the litigation between Slingerland and Ludwig on the plastic drum head. And I went to Tennessee and chased down a guy named Billy Ray Connor, who was making the plastic heads for Slingerland, which brought the litigation by Ludwig saying, hey, you can't be doing that and blah, blah, blah. And I found, uh, the lock firm in Shelbyville, uh, uh, Kentucky or Tennessee, that had uh, represented Slingerland, and they sold me transcripts. Uh, it, 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 that was kind of unusual too. I was kind of holding my breath when I requested it, and they decided, "Hey, it's it's been forty years; nobody's going to care." And they actually sold me at ten cents a page, hundreds of pages of the transcripts of the the trial. And, and it was amazing. And this man, uh, Mr. Connor, had testified at, at that trial. And he told me that if only Bud and the chief had come to terms and, and, and uh, found a common ground, they could have protected the, the process, the copyright, or the, the trademarked and patented process of tucking the plastic heads into the metal hoops and and owned it and made lots more money, but it was much more important to each man to win than to settle. <laughs> and at one point they were they were they were challenging each other. One the, the Bud wanted to go to a gym and put on boxing gloves and fight it out and everything. They were just furious with each other. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it, it was kind of too bad, but uh, it was a fascinating story. <laughs> but that just sounds, that sounds really, really interesting uh, part of history. But so where does Remo Belly play a role in this whole plastic head thing then? Uh, early on, he was approached by Chick Webb, who, and he almost bought uh, Evans, Chick Webb. Uh, is kind of credited with the first plastic drum head, but the challenge was in how to fasten the plastic to the hoop or the flesh hoop. And he was using tacks and he tried to sell Remo on, on that and selling the whole company. And Remo instead went with the concept of a guy named Sam Butchnik, 
who developed the epoxy that goes into the metal hoop and, and kind of glued it in, as opposed to Slingerland and Ludwig who were crimping it. And uh, actually that crimping process of squeezing the, the metal uh, counter hoop into the, or flesh hoop into the plastic to grip it, but without the epoxy that Remo was using, mm -hmm. um, turned out to be considered prior art because the Pullman company was using that kind of crimping with a, a steel insert to mount screens on their railroad cars. Oh, interesting. Uh, so it's the same concept. Okay. Uh, so they, they kind of developed in, in different fields. Evans went on to eventually become kind of a, a molded uh, uh, flesh hoop. Uh, so it was kind of three different technologies used by Remo with the metal flesh hoop with the epoxy in it and Evans with the completely synthetic or, or uh, chemical based, I guess you would call it, flesh hoop. And then the uh, Ludwig Slingerland method of, of simply crimping it in there and squeezing the, the uh, metal hoop to hold it. So there, there's, there's a lot of interviews out there on uh, the history of that. I, uh, Bart Vandersey at the uh, Drum History Podcast has done a couple interviews with uh, Remo and Evans guys. Okay. And, and usually the narrative is slightly different depending on who's telling the story. <laughs> so I would encourage people that are really interested to listen to all those interviews and mm -hmm. and kind of sort it out. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. So I just realized we're, we're coming up in an hour here. Um, I just have a couple more questions and then uh, I'll ask you about the Chicago Drum Show. Sure. Um, so in your opinion, what is the health of the drum market right now? Um, as we're seeing a lot of manufacturers uh, coming together, you know, being bought out or buying each other up. Um, where do you see this all going to ending up? And is, is it healthy at the moment or is it just corporations or is there actually a financial issue behind it as well? Uh, that, could, that could be discussed at great length and debated at great length, but but just as a quick and dirty answer, I I think it's real healthy now. Uh, kids have a lot of a lot more uh, educational uh, facilities available to them uh, with all the stuff that Hudson's doing, of course, but also just playing YouTube and and all the podcasts that are out there and everything. And they're they're picking up on it. And electronics haven't uh, killed acoustics by any means. Um, Corporate-wise, I don't really know. Um, I have seen a little bit of a pulling back, uh, especially since COVID, in terms of participation in and support for the drum show. Um, uh, some of the companies like uh, Ludwig and Pearl that, that exhibited in the past had, had pulled back and they're, they're supporting clinicians less and so on. Um, in terms of their overall numbers, I don't really know, but I find I, I don't know as many people at those companies as I used to. Um, there was, of course, a lot of personnel shifting in 2020 when virtually everybody was working from home and and all of a sudden, somebody that I tried to call was no longer there. They changed jobs and working for a different company. So that's kind of a non-answer, but I don't really know on the corporate side of things. But what I do see is a lot of help in the small custom drum companies. And some of them are, are growing to a point where uh, they're getting to be pretty major companies. I, I don't think... Any of them are, are quite what I would consider corporate yet, but they're doing remarkable things and they're they're very healthy. I I don't know too much about uh, um, where C and C is these days, but back they exhibited at the show in the early days as Cardwell and Carrington, and it uh, they've kind of gone separate ways now. But Bill Cardwell's I know doing some pretty remarkable stuff, and he's one of the bigger ones in, in terms of a niche or, or 
boutique market. Okay. But uh, the ones that I see uh, coming to the show are like uh, Joyful Noise, Indie Drum Company, a &F Drums, uh, Virtue Drums from here in uh, Michigan, uh, Jenkins Martin. And then there's a whole another category of guys like uh, Billy Baker who are kind of customizing from existing top line drums, but uh, customizing for specific artists doing the kiss drums and that kind of okay. thing. So uh, that whole market is, seems to be doing very well. Um, I went down to check out the uh, Nashville drum show last year. They're in about, they're going into their third year now. And uh, they're approaching it very similar to the way I do the Chicago drum show in terms of layout and logistics and stuff. And I, I saw a lot of the same, a lot of my exhibitors from the Chicago show were down there. And then a few that were more regional that were from the South and so on. So I think it's great if we could get about another three or four shows going nationally. So there's one in the South and one on the West Coast. and and so on you'll be seeing even more of these uh custom guys uh because it it's kind of an investment to come from la or somewhere and come to chicago and right. get your all your equipment there and all that uh but overall i think i think the drum business and the cymbal business are are very healthy but uh, i think the pies being cut into smaller slices uh, <laughs> in, in both arenas you know I just that's realized me. there's a name that I it would be unforgivable to leave out, and that's uh, Trick Drums. Oh, yeah. Because actually they're uh, the same age as Rebeats and DW, incidentally. All three of us, uh, Rebeats, uh, Trick, and DW, are, are citing 72 as a startup date. So they're, Trick is 50 years old now, so they're not an upstart, but... But and they've done a lot of special stuff. Their their strainers have ended up on a lot of other people's uh, drums and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, Mike Mike Dorfman has been coming to the Chicago show for thirty years now and does some remarkable stuff. But it's still kind of considered, I I think, a, a boutique company. Mm -hmm. You still run into people that aren't familiar with them, but they're, oh, they're yeah. an important part of the whole food chain out there. Definitely. Yeah, it's just kind of an exciting time. because you, So two standout companies to me that I see a press say within the last two to three years to me is the British Drum Company and then a &F Drums. Mm -hmm. And I, I've been blown away by both companies approaching drum craftsmanship from two totally, two, two totally different part areas, you know. Like yeah. in a &F, the first time I tried a and f it kind of went against everything I thought a drum had to be. They're soft. They're, they they you can squish them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you know, thought is well, it's not going to be, it's not going to hold up, it's not going to sound good. But man, those drums are amazing. How they sound. Have you seen the Big Bertha Two news? Uh, no? Yeah. Well, I posted the news on my website about that. Okay. So I, okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rami is going to be giving a presentation at the Chicago Drum Show this uh, next year in 2023 on how he made that drum which is going to be really interesting. We've had the Purdue drum at the drum show twice. And, okay. uh, uh, and I, I have also met Bertha, who was from Chicago, but ended up at the University of Texas. And uh, both schools were for, you know, generations claiming to have the world's largest bass drum. And neither school was really interested in a face-off. But the <laughs> University of Chicago had their centennial year borrowed Bertha back from Texas to have on campus. And they, they put a paper head on with the University of Chicago logo and so on. And my son was about 10 then, and we made a road trip to go down and meet uh, Bertha and to drive to Purdue and, uh, and visit the Purdue drum again. Uh, I, so I imagine all of them will continue to say, we have the world's largest bass drum because nobody wants to be mean spirited enough to litigate and say you can't say that anymore because <laughs> they're all big drums right. but now i guess the the record kind of goes to uh the drum that anf is making uh, or has made a big bertha too they the university of texas is uh retiring bertha and you're going to put her on display somewhere and they have this fantastic new drum that that ronnie has made uh, so i'm looking forward to seeing his presentation and see how that drum came together well, the technology that went into Big Bertha 2 also is 
the same technology they're using for their feather feather light uh series of drums they just came out with so and those they sound amazing too they're aluminum and um they they still have that nice a and f sound to them so uh it's really neat and I, what what i like about british drum company is that they're taking hand craftsmanship to a production level but at least still to this point they're they're able to con um maintain output and not increase production where they start losing the quality of their manufacturing yeah. so it'll be yeah. interesting to see if they can continue that that process um i kind of think they will because that's kind of where their focus is but mm -hmm. it's, it's just when i look at some of these other boutique companies talk to more of these people it's amazing the craftsmanship that are going into drums like you said it's a, it's a really exciting time so yeah well, Rob, thank you so much. It's been amazing to get to talk to you. Again, I've been a fan of your work for years, uh, and you're just such a powerhouse in, in the drumming community, especially with the Chicago Drum Show and everything else. So thank you very much for your time today. Appreciate oh, my it. pleasure. My pleasure. This has been a production of the Drumming News Network. All rights reserved. All media is owned by the respective parties. This episode cannot be distributed or copied in any form. Please visit DrummingNewsNetwork.com daily to keep up on all the latest drumming news. Copyright 2023.